Okay, so good morning, and uh, before we discuss the Parsha, let us discuss what day it is on the Jewish calendar. Today is the 10th day of the Hebrew month of Tevet. Tishrei Cheshvan Kislev Tevet. Tevet is the fourth month, like, the, like April in the Gregorian calendar, Lahabdil, the 10th day. Today is one of the minor fast days. What are minor fast days? We have two full fast days, Yom Kippur and... Tisha B'Av. These are 25-hour fast. The only fast which can occur on Shabbat is Yom Kippur. If, if, if uh, Tisha B'Av falls on a Shabbat, we push the fast for Saturday night through, oh, Monday, through Sunday. Be- why only Yom Kippur? Because the Torah calls Yom Kippur Shabbat Shabbaton, the Sabbath of all Sabbaths. So it's the only one which trumps the dignity of Shabbat in which we're supposed to have regal enjoyments on Shabbat and eat well and drink well to enhance our spiritual experience of Shabbat. Um, the tenth of Tevet is like the fast of Esther, which is a minor fast day. There is another one on the third of Tishrei called Tzom Gedalia. Gedalia was after the destruction of the Song of the Tzom, the fast of Gedalia. Gedalia was a guy who lived in Israel after the Babylonians destroyed the first temple, and he was kind of, it was kind of like a puppet government. He was nominated by the Babylonians to run the Jews who were left in Israel, and he was assassinated by Jewish zealots who didn't like the fact that he was a puppet governor. And so the, after that, they had to escape to Egypt. So to this day, a day after Rosh Hashanah, we have a fast called the Fast of Gedalia in honor of this guy, Gedalia ben Achikam. And what's the lesson? That we have enough enemies, God forbid, that we should start killing each other and fall into civil war. That's why during Israel's uh, War of Independence, when the Irgun under Menachem Begin was trying to bring its own weapons and Ben-Gurion didn't allow it and at some point gave orders to shoot at the boat called Altalena. Menachem Begin was on the boat and he cried on radio and he said, don't, don't uh, shoot back. We don't want a civil war of brother against brother. And 22 years ago, we had the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. So every day, every year, the, the day right after Rosh Hashanah, we have a minor fast. Another minor fast is the 17th of Tammuz which ushers in the three-week period leading up to Tisha B'Av. Okay? So this day, today's minor fast, minor fast is from dawn till uh, the stars come out at night, when it's fully dark after sunset. When the, it's called Seita Kochavim. It's a 12-hour hypothetical. Yeah, it's more like 14. And today it ends at 5.31 p.m. So what happened on the 10th of Tevet? Uh, probably around the year 587 BCE, before the Common Era. Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian uh, emperor, you know, there is, a, there is a, an opera by, Joseph, by Verdi called Nabokov about that and about how the exiles, the Jews, went to Babylonia. Uh, Babylonia, as an empire, had an interesting geopolitical policy. They would destroy the religious centers of their colonies, like the kingdom of Judea. They destroyed the temple, and they would exile to Babylonia the political and religious elite. And the people who were allowed to stay in Israel were called Dalata Am, the impoverished amongst the people. people. The common people, right? Um, But then when uh, the Babylonians lost the hegemony, the dominance in the region to the Persians, Cyrus came in, and Cyrus had an antithetical geopolitical strategy. He actually allowed religious minorities to have religious autonomy. He allowed us to go back to Israel, rebuild the temple. As long as we were paying taxes like good children, he was happy. So he had a different approach. That's why we were allowed to go back and build the temple. In any event, the 10th of uh, Tevet, which is today's fast day, is about when the siege, the Babylonian siege on Jerusalem started. 
So when a siege starts, it's around the walls, right? These are ancient cities. It takes a while until they can break in the walls. Starvation starts. There's lack of food. There's lack of water. Uh, when Israel was established, uh, in the early 50s, after Israel was established in 48, um, the two chief rabbis, the Sephardic chief rabbi, Rabbi Ben Sion Oziel, and Rabbi Yitzhak Herzog, the chief Ashkenazi rabbis, who were both great men, um, they declared that the 10th of Tevet should be Yom HaKadish HaKlali. It should be the general day of saying Kadish, also for the martyrs of the Holocaust. Um, so it's known as that in Israel. And uh, so why do we fast? You know, it's a historical fact. It was 26, 27 centuries ago. But uh, there are other reasons we fast that I think are important. One is solidarity. Solidarity with all Jews across the world today, across space. You know, two synagogues were desecrated in the Iranian city of Shiraz earlier this week. The Torah scrolls were torn and prayer books were thrown uh, and all kinds of things I don't want to even say. So, so we have solidarity when we fast with the Jews all over the world. The Jews in Europe, you know, their conditions, the Jews uh, in, in Iran, in other places, even the Jews of Israel who live under the shadow of terrorism. It's also solidarity across time with all the persecution of the Jewish people. You know, last night I was watching a movie on Amazon Prime called Swimming in Auschwitz, and it's a story of, I think, eight women who survived Auschwitz, and one of them is Ron Nessem, our board member, his mother-in-law. She's in that movie. So we fast also out of solidarity for those of us who underwent real hardship. Um, and we fast out of it because it fosters humility, you know. We feel very comfortable and satiated. We get to live in a very prosperous uh, area of the world. We have more material uh, possessions than 95, 99% of humanity, right? When you look at the billions in the developing world, uh, you fast for a few hours, you start feeling a little uncomfortable gives you a little bit of humility. You realize just how fragile we are. And of course, uh, fasting can foster gratitude for everything that we have. We can learn to reappreciate. So we really fast uh, for all these reasons. We fast for all these reasons. Now last week, uh, to, to, today we're starting Vayechi, which is uh, the Torah portion of uh, the concluding Torah portion of Genesis, of Bereshit. The opening book of the Torah is the longest book. Uh, it's the end of, of it, so we're going to move from family sagas, right? It's all about family sagas, Adam and Eve blaming each other, who made the other eat the forbidden fruit, Cain and Abel, and all the different sibling rivalries we've seen with the patriarchs and matriarchs, and even between the different women, right? Sagar, Sarah and Hagar, Rachel and Leah. Um, we're going to move from fam familial sagas, from family and its discontents, to nation building, what we call in political science nation building. Um, first political emancipation and then spiritual emancipation. Um, we'll talk about it next week. Um, there's a lot to be said about that. But for now, I want to say that uh, before we jump into the text, that last week we read the Torah portion of Vaigash, which was about Judah approaching Joseph, telling him that he's willing to take life imprisonment instead of Benjamin, because Joseph planted the goblet, the Kiddush cup, in, J in Benjamin's bag. It was all a trick. And once Judah did that, Joseph... Uh, forgave the brothers, he realized they learned their lesson, and he told them not to fear him because he believes that everything that happened was the hand of God. It was all part of a divinely orchestrated plan so that they can be protected in Egypt. He gets them, uh, his family, to dwell in the land of Goshen, which was the most fertile uh, area in, in Egypt, 
and uh, they dwelled there. And uh, Jacob ultimately comes as well, and they all uh, dwell in Egypt in the land of Goshen. And uh, and the parasha ended uh, with the fact that the children of Israel settled in the uh, in Goshen, and they uh, and they increased uh, their property there. And also, uh, there was a, a great demographic rise there. The population since, since the grew. enslavement of, of our people in Egypt, when does it take place? Is it, I know it's the change of Pharaoh, but mm-hmm. how many years did they live under? The, it's a good question. You know, the Torah itself doesn't really say. And so the rabbis debate. It's really interesting because once we start the book of Shemot next week, God willing, it says these are the names of the children of Israel who came back, to, who, who moved down to Egypt. And the names is Shemot. That's why it's called the book of Shemot, the book of the names. In English it's called Exodus because of the exit from Egypt. And then it says, Vayakom Melech A new pharaoh arose over Egypt, a new king. And then Rashi in his commentary says, that there is a debate between two rabbis in the uh, Mishnah, in the Talmud, whether it was the same pharaoh having a change of heart or, whether, or was it a new pharaoh. So it's not exactly clear. But, you know, I, I don't know if I'm wrong, but I think in the, during the Pesach, we mentioned that we were enslaved 500 years. Or 420, yeah, they're, they're different. It was a considerable period. The, yeah, the Torah says around 400 years, and Rashi claims it was under two centuries and it was cut short because of good behavior. So it depends. If you go by the Torah text itself, it says around 400 plus. 400 plus. If you go by Rashi and the rabbinic commentators, which is really well, our tradition. If you kind of do the math, you say, well, we lived under excellent conditions for... 80 years, I bet that. Yeah, yes, sir. We were listening to Rashi. Mm -hmm. Were there plagues and things like that? Sure. Pharaoh changed his mind? Sure, sure, sure. But that's not good behavior then. He did it because he saw that there was... Oh, no, good behavior for us, not for him. Oh. Yeah. (laughs) So so let's go to Vayechi. Vayechi means, and he lived. And it's the opening word of the parasha. And you're already going to see a conundrum, which we will revisit. What is the conundrum? What is the dissonance? Vayechi means, and he lived, like the word Chaim. But really, everybody dies in the Parsha. The Parsha is going to start with Jacob on his deathbed, giving instructions to his children. And then we're going to have the death of Joseph at the very end of the Parsha. And uh, in the Haftarah, in the prophetic reading, we're reading about the death of King David. So why is it called Vayechi? And one way to understand it is, what does it mean to live a life? What does it mean to live? And what does it mean to die? You know, when uh, Yoni Netanyahu, uh, first let's say this, there is a verse in the Torah, in, uh, in the book of Deuteronomy, in the Torah portion of Vayit Hanan, second Torah portion of Deuteronomy, there is a verse that in the Ashkenazi and Hasidic world is recited right before you start reading from the Torah. Any day you read Torah, Monday, Thursday, Shabbat, holidays. And the, and, and the verse is, You who are glued to God, wholeheartedly and utterly atta- attached to God, in consciousness, in heart and mind, are alive today. But what does it mean alive? It means enlivened energized, rejuvenated, impassioned, spiritually awakened, not just living by sheer inertia, by sheer biological inertia. So Vayechi really talks about what does it mean to really live. And I started saying that when Yoni Netanyahu, who was Prime Minister Netanyahu's brother, died, uh, fell in the IDF, Ehud Barak, who was his commander, eulogized him and said that there are some people who only live until the age of 30, like the older Netanyahu brother, he, he was killed when he was 30, but they live a full life. 
And there are some people who can live maybe even a century, but in that sense don't live a full life. So what does it mean to live a few life, a, a full life? It's a huge discussion, right? Um, one uh, non-Jewish source, Stephen Covey, in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which I highly recommend, he talks about the four L's. Live, which means to live three-dimensionally. You know, you live, uh, you live a full life, and, and a full life also includes sometimes crisis and heartache and loss. To learn, both to learn intellectually and to learn from life itself and the mistakes we make. To love, which is relationships, not only with the people we love the most, but with as many people as possible, different gradations of relationships. And to, last one is legacy, to leave a legacy. And that's why, uh, that's why it's called Vayechi, and he lived, because the Talmud says, uh, Jacob, our father, never died. As long as his seed is alive, his descendants, he is alive. In other words, we are the descendants of Israel, the children of Israel, right? Yeah. And, uh, and as long as we are alive and we're continu con continuing his way of being, the Israel way of being in the world, then in yeah, the most the right, deep and spiritual of senses, his legacy lives on. And that's why also when we sing David Melech Israel, we say Chai Vekayam, alive and existing, right? How can we say that? Well, the idea is also that King David is, amongst other things, the author of the Psalms of Tehillim. And as long as we connect to the legacy that King David left us, then he is uh, he's still alive. Shakespeare once wrote a beautiful love sonnet to probably a woman he loved, and, uh, and, it, and it ends with these words. He says at the end of the poem, uh, as long as eyes can see, right, as long as there are people walking around being able to see, and man can breathe, as long as humanity is around, so long lives this, this sonnet, this poem, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee and this gives you life right it's uh we uh we perpetuate the, uh, our loved ones by by perpetuating their legacy yeah so it's a little bit like uh when people open a fund or a foundation or a prize named after a loved one and you see somebody re receiving that fund or that prize and giving a thank you speech and talking about, you know, what, are, what is the legacy of that person. And I think it's something that every human being has to, every reflective human being, every Jew should ask themselves at some point, uh, what legacy do I want to live, uh, leave behind? Do that we have an obligation to le leave behind in this world not only a monetary inheritance but a legacy right and the legacy of course has to do with passing on the Jewish tradition so it's a very powerful pasha we already see right so let's see what's going on um, we are on page 240 in the Arya Kaplan uh, Chumash and Jacob lived in Egypt 17 years. And the sum total of Jacob's years were uh, 147 years. 147 years. So, Vayechi, if you're into numerology, the numerical value of the opening word Vayechi, and he lived, is 34, the number 34. The Yud is 10, so two Yuds is 20. How do you put a numerical value? Uh, it, the, uh, the way it works is Aleph is 1, right. Bet is 2, right. Gimel is 3, and then you get to Yud, it's 10. And from once you get to Yud, you start doubling, going up by 10. 
So after you, there's Kaf, it's 20. Lamed is 30. That's how it goes. You get to Kuf, it's 100. Reish Shin Tav is 200, 300, 400. It was like Hebrew Roman numerals? Was they give a numerical value to each letter. So Aleph is 1, Bet is 2, Gimel is 3. Each letter gets a numerical value. And there's how many? There's like so 24 letters in the alphabet. 22. 22. 22. Yeah. So Rabbi, so uh, a certain name, Judah, came mm-hmm. to numerical value. Did you say 40? Did you say? What's the numerical value for oh, Judah? For Judah? Yeah. Uh, no, no, I'm saying for Vayechi. Oh, oh, for or for Vayahi, which is the so Vayahi, yeah, it's twenty, it's thirty-four. Okay, so what does that mean? So what the sages do, they look for symbolisms. What other words are thirty-four? So so here's what they're gonna do. This is what there's a commentator called Bal Haturim. He's nicknamed after one of his books. I think his name was Rabbi Yaakov Ben Asher, and he is the master of numerology of gematria. So he says Vayechi, and he lived as 34. And then it says Jacob lived in Egypt 17 years. 17 is equivalent. This is all numerical symbolism. It's, it's symbolisms. So 17 in, uh, in numerology is, is, an, is uh, identical with the Hebrew word Tov. Tov means good. Tov is also 17. So he had 17 good years in Egypt. And what are the other 17 good years he had, the commentators say? The 17 years from Joseph's birth until when Joseph disappeared and he thought that Joseph was devoured by uh, an animal. So these were the two 17 years. So there are many ways of looking at it. Jacob had a hard life. In last week's Parsha, the Pharaoh says, nice to meet you. He says, nice to meet you too. Pharaoh says, tell me about yourself. And Jacob says, few and bad were the days of my life. Jacob uh, had to run away from home. He was cheated by his uncle in business. Uh, his daughter was violated. Uh, he thought he lost his, uh, his son. He had a hard life. So, um, so the, first 17, the two, two sets of good 17 years. The first set is when he raised his children. And now, those 17 years, his oldest child, Joseph, takes care of him. So maybe this is what we call in Judaism ultimate nachat, ultimate pleasure, right? Our children are born, they make a lot of noise, they keep us awake at night, and then they keep us awake at night for many years for many reasons. You know, there is uh, the haftarah that we read on... uh, on Rosh Hashanah, on the first day, or the second day rather, is from the book of Jeremiah. And it says, the prophet says, Haben Yakirli Ephraim, my beloved son Ephraim, I care about him so much, Al Ken Hamu Me'ai, so much that my innards are twisting inside out. So, you know, parents care so much for their children, they're so concerned about them, that it can turn our kishkas, our inners, inside out. It's so, so, so Jacob had pleasure. At the end of his life, he could be more relaxed. He saw his son's worldly success, but also his son's and his children's Torah success. He could study Torah with his grandchildren or even just play with his grandchildren. So these were great years for him. Now Rashi says yes, something... Rabbi, yes. Is it possible to turn off the heater? Or are you, are you, oh, um, I'm fine. I'm you're fine. If you want it off, go ahead. I mean, are you cold? I'm warm. I'm warm. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay leave it, let it be. Are you sure? Yeah, no, I can, I can it's turn. It's better be warm than cold. <laughs> are you sure? Because okay. I can go close it. No, 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 no. All right. Cold. All right. No, I didn't say so, I didn't say it was fine. Oh. You can turn it off. Oh, yeah? I don't think I'll right. turn it off. All right. I'll turn it off. Yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll continue in 30 seconds. I'll just... Uh, sorry, uh, people are really uh, hot in there. Oh, that's fine.
Thanks. Okay. So uh, let's continue. So Rashi says something really interesting. Thank you. My pleasure. Rashi says that Rashi notices something that you, you can't really see in the Chumash that we have, which is when you read this Parsha in the Torah scroll, there's something really unique. What is that unique thing? That unique thing is that um, this Parsha starts in the middle of a line on a Torah scroll. Usually when a new Torah portion starts, it starts in a new paragraph, right? Or, if, or at least there is a gap in the line to show that a new section is starting. Here, it's just the next word. It's unique. Mm. And, um, and, and what Rashi says is um, that as soon as Jacob died, that corresponds to your question earlier, Ralph, uh, the eyes and hearts of the children of Israel were closed uh, be- because the misery of the slavery started. So once Jacob died, all hell broke, broke loose, and shortly after that, the enslavement started. That's according to Rashi. So then we can assume that it's either 70 or 34 years? Because it's 70 uh, years. Yeah, that uh, would mean 17 years, according to Rashi. Yeah. Uh, but people can count differently. So there is a message here that, you know, there is a chapter of Tehillim, of Psalms, that we read every Friday night on Kabbalah Shabbat and Shabbat morning with the opening Psalms, Psukei de Zimra. Psalm 92, I believe. It says that a tzaddik, a righteous man, a righteous person, is analogous to a palm tree. Tzaddik katamari frach. Why is a righteous person analogous to a palm tree? We have a lot of very thin, very tall palm trees in our neck of the woods, so we know that they can be really difficult to measure. Right? You need like a firefighter's ladder to really Uh measure a very tall palm tree. So it's only when a palm tree falls that you can fully ascertain its stature. Similarly, when, uh, when a nation is orphaned because a, a great person died, um, then it leaves, that person leaves a void. That person leaves a void, right? A spiritual void, or if it's in politics, a political void. So he's saying the death of Jacob, the greatest patriarchs, according to Kabbalah, according to a lot of sages, Jacob was the finest patriarch. Why? Because Abram was all about reaching out and giving to others. Yitzchak was very introverted. And Yaakov was the perfect balance between Yitzchak, which was self-restraint, and his grandfather Avraham, which was about loving kindness. He achieved some sort of a cosmic balance. He was also uh, very studious and spiritual, but he was also a world-class businessman. So he's known as uh, as the as the finest patriarch. So that created like a an endarkment, so to speak, a sealing of the eyes and hearts of the people of Israel. Another thing that uh, Rashi says that Jacob wanted to reveal to his descendants his children what's going to happen in the end of days when the world is finally redeemed or at the very least according to some commentators when is the enslavement in Egypt when are they going to go back to Israel but uh, he wasn't able uh, to do that he had like a spiritual block and maybe it's a it's a message to us that rather than focus on things that we can't control we should focus on the things that we can control. For example, every one of us, just by virtue of being human, we ask ourselves, what's going to be with my business in five years, in ten years, you know? What's going to be when I uh, retire? What's going to be when I need to pay this or that for my children? Uh, We always think about things that are years down the line, and that can be kind of paralyzing. Maybe the message is that it's good to focus on what you can do now 
and not kind of debilitate yourself by just being an anxious about the far future. So I read somebody wrote uh, recently that a person really shouldn't be overwhelmed by anxiety about anything. Because whatever I can do something about, I should just do it. Whatever I can't do anything about, I shouldn't worry because it's not in my hands. It's easier said than done, but uh, that's the message. So Jacob knows, you know, uh, there, great people sometimes really sense when their time is up. So in verse 29, So Jacob's, uh, you know, his, his days are numbered. He knows he's about to die. He, called his, he calls his son Joseph and tells him, if I, if I find favor in your eyes, place your hand under my thigh. Why under my thigh? They didn't have Torahs. The only mitzvah they had was circumcision. So we're, you know, and, 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 and uh, fulfill with me chesed ve'emet, loving kindness and truth. Don't bury me in Egypt. So why is it called loving kindness and truth? Uh, Rashi explains because when you help someone posthumously, when that person is deceased, then you know you're not going to get anything back. So it's the purest kind of mitzvah when you do a loving gesture for somebody who is no longer in this world. Um, and he doesn't want to be buried uh, in Egypt. And Rashi gives s- several reasons. One, there's going to be the plague of lice in the ground in Egypt. Um, so he foresees the plagues? Yeah, according to Rashi, yeah. He, uh, he makes all kinds of uh, sp- spiritual reasons and also that he was nervous that the Egyptians will turn his uh, burial place into an idolatrous site. Because he was a great man and he didn't want people coming worshipping in his grave. That's something interesting we have in Judaism, right? Moses' grave was also rendered unknown. Right? When Moses died, we don't know where he was buried. And some people say for the same reason, that they don't want people... This is what know. I don't get, Rabbi. When I was in Israel, we went to... What is the name where all the rabbis are there? Har Meron. Oh, the Har... The Ol... Uh, Ma'at HaMachpela. No, 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 the no. Ol... Uh, There's a town Har- where all the... Uh, in Sfat? Yeah. Oh yeah, in Sfat, yeah, Rabbi Caro and all the Kabbalists, yeah. And I see people work shipping and like. And yeah, it's a, it's a big, not, it's a I, big I, question. I I, heard, I I said this is not. Yeah. What I believe my religion is. So there is a big tension about this, and I heard a prominent the Guru, the Guru. rabbi in Israel, Rabbi Shlomo Aviner. There's a town in Israel. So people pray uh, by by the graves of. Uh, of great sages and rabbis, um, great spiritual luminaries. So I heard Rabbi Shlomo Aviner, who is a prominent rabbi in Israel, say the following. He says, in order to grow spiritually, each one of us need to do the spiritual work. So it's okay to go and pray at the uh, resting site of a, of a great spiritual figure if you understand that, God forbid, you're not praying to that person. You're praying to Hashem, but you are inspired by virtue of being at the place where a great tzaddik is laid to rest, and that that inspires you to pray with more fervor, with more devotion. That's okay. But God forbid if somebody makes the mistakes and and pleads in his prayers with a tzaddik, instead of the tzaddik as an inspirational vessel to Hashem, then that's a big problem. He's glorifying him as a Hashem. Ex- exactly. And that's why, and I'm very into Hasidic, uh, the Hasidic way in, philosoph- in uh, Jewish philosophy and psychology, but that's one of the criticisms outside the Hasidic world from the beginning of Hasidism to today that some people feel that the line between worshipping the great Hasid or Tzaddik and admiring him can be very blurry, right? So, so you know, it's very tricky. There's a lot of tension. What I, what I experience, I, I would say that these people were, call it, uh, 
praying or idolizing mm -hmm. this that they could yeah. the rest there. right right and I found it like no 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 yeah I understand what you mean so uh, it's it's a very tricky thing and 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 some people feel the way you do and it, it has to be very it has to be very nuanced so uh, so Joseph so Jacob makes Joseph pray that he will bury him in Israel when he dies and Joseph on verse 31 uh, swears to his father that he'll do it and then uh, verse 48 uh, chapter 48 verse 1 it came to pass after these things and Joseph was told by an emissary according to uh, Rashi behold your father is sick Israel is really sick now Jacob and he took both his sons with him Menashe and Ephraim I want you to notice two very interesting things. One is, when Avram became Avraham, the Torah no longer calls him Avram, only Avraham. Right? When Sarai became Sarah, she's only called Sarah. The only person who keeps on having both his names interchangeably is Yaakov. Sometimes he's called Yaakov by his old name. Sometimes he's Israel by the new name he got from the angel. And one way to understand it is Yaakov means to follow, right? To hold the heel of someone, to follow. And Israel is, uh, entails a leadership role. Israel can also be read Yashar El, straight to God. It's a message to, to us that some areas of our life we need to follow. We need to follow our tradition, the ways of our family, the ways of our community, the way of the Jewish people, right? We're not going to reinvent the wheel. But in, other, in certain areas of our lives, we do have to initiate and innovate. And that's why Yaakov is sometimes called Yaakov and sometimes Israel. And he has two sons, Menashe and Ephraim. So Joseph goes to see his father Israel, Jacob, when uh, his father is uh, really gravely ill now. And he brings his two kids, Menashe and Ephraim. And uh, Menashe is the older one and Ephraim is the younger one. Menashe means, the Torah says, th he thanked God that God helped him forget all the travails that he had to go through when he was sold into slavery and the imprisonment, all the tragic chapters of his life. And Ephraim means that uh, I became uh, fruitful and prosperous. So it's maybe it's a message for us in life that first we need to make good with the past, including the painful past and then we can move on to a better future but what's going to happen now is that in verse 2 Jacob is being told behold your son Joseph is coming and is and uh, and Israel Jacob is sitting on the bed and Jacob says to Joseph in verse 3 that Kel Shaddai it's one of God's name appeared before me before I left Israel and he blessed me and he promised me that the land of Canaan is the land of Israel is for for ours for our family uh, for perpetuity a and uh, and in verse 5 he says that Hashem told him that Ephraim and Menashe should be like children like children to me not like grandchildren they should be like Reuben and Shimon on verse 5 what does that mean it means that that they're gonna be Ephraim and Menashe are gonna be two tribes. So Yos there's no tribe of Yosef. There's a tribe. There are two tribes after his children, Ephraim and Menashe. So how do we still have twelve tribes? Uh, we take out Levi when we say we have twelve tribes, because Levi, the tribe of Le Levi, didn't have its own territory, its own real estate. It it subsisted, it lived on the, uh, what was given to the Levim at the temple for the roles that they provide. Uh, now, in verse 7, sometimes when people are closer to the end of their life, they start reminiscing about painful things in their lives. I don't know if you've ever seen that, you know. My grandmother, of blessed memory, lost one child shortly after childbirth, and she never talked about it. When she became really old, she started talking about it. Hey, Judith, how are you doing? Sorry. It's okay. So uh, grab yourself a, 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 a Torah, please. So it says, um, 
he, he's reminiscing, he's saying, Jacob is saying to Joseph, uh, when I came back to Israel from Padan, from Syria, uh, Rachel, your mother, my second wife, died in uh, Canaan on the way, and, and I buried her there uh, in Bethlehem, right? City which, of course, uh, exists to this day. We are on page 240, 240. 240, Judith. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, sure. So, um, uh, now, uh, verse 8. Then Joseph, uh, Jacob, Israel, uh, asks uh, his, his, uh, his son Joseph, Who are these kids? Um, and Joseph says to his father, These are the sons which Hashem has given me. So Jacob says, Bring me those two grandkids, and I'll, and I'll bless them. Okay? That's, by the way, the end of the uh, first Aliyah for Shabbat. Now we continue on verse 10. And, and uh, Israel's eyes were too heavy that he could not see. Just remind you of something? When Yitzchak could not see, right? A- and he came close to them and he kissed them and hugged them. Very moving scene, right? We have a grandfather on his deathbed asking to bless and kiss and hug his, his grandsons. Verse 11, and, and Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face again, and God has been good to me. I get to see you and your kids. And uh, I guess they were sitting on uh, Joseph's lap, laps, because, uh, because it says in verse 12 that Joseph took him, he took him from Jacob's knees and prostrated himself to the ground. So Joseph did a... Uh, a cultural bow of respect and honor to his father. And now, look what's happening. Uh, uh, in verse 13, Joseph is preparing both his sons, Ephraim and Menashe, to be blessed by their grandfather, Jacob. So who is older? Ephraim. Um, oh, no, no Mena- Menashe is older. I'm giving you the answer. You don't need to check. Okay. Menashe is older and Ephraim is younger. So I'm going to show. I'm going to the right first. I'm going to show you the choreography. <coughs> if I am Joseph, yeah, and this computer screen is is kids. Jacob, and these are the kids. So I'm putting the older one, uh, Menashe. I'm I'm Joseph. I'm putting the older one, Menashe, here to my left, which is to Jacob's right. right. Okay, that's why I said right. And then it's confusing. And then I'm putting Ephraim, my younger kid, here because it will be to Jacob's uh, left. left. But, and, but yeah. where's Joseph? And I'm here. Middle. This is Joseph. But this is Jacob. Jacob. This is oh, older sorry, boy. He put himself in the middle. Or behind. Behind, behind. Behind, okay. Now, now look what's happening. So he's preparing naturally that his father will bless the <laughs> oldest first so the and the right, youngest. That's right. And what's going to happen? What always happens in the book of Genesis? The younger one gets the blessing. <laughs> now, I think I mentioned it last week. Uh, we did mention it last week that Judaism is a critique. Uh, the Torah is a critique of... of uh, of worldly power that has no merit. It's a critique of empire, right? Uh, Abram gets out of Mesopotamia, which was this place where they build those huge towers. Like in Egypt, you have the pyramids, and uh, the kings had divine rights, and everybody else had very little. The same thing in Egypt. Pharaoh looked at himself as a god, everybody else very little. And always the oldest used to get double the inheritance, right? But the, the Torah starts, in, Ge- in Genesis at least, starts kind of pushing that aside and saying, no, no, whoever deserves, gets. Whoever has the most competence and merit, right? So as part of that, what's going to happen now is that Jacob, is, instead of going like this, He's going to go like this. He's going to cross his arms 
and he's going to start by blessing Ephraim, the younger one. And, 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 and Joseph is going to think that his father is having a senior a moment, that he's making a mistake. Why is right? the younger one always, uh, there's no longer a, a feeling that experience matters? Or? Well, it's not experience. It's, uh, it's really competence. You know, it's like, um, suppose today somebody has a company, a business, a big business, and there are two brothers, and they're five years apart. And one of them is a great guy, and his talents are in music, whatever, uh, or in some other field. And the younger one was born with this phenomenal business acumen. So it would make more sense for the younger brother to run the company on a daily basis. Doesn't mean that he should get more inheritance necessarily from the parents, but it means that he's better suited to lead the business enterprise. Make sense? I think that's where the Torah is going. The Torah is going into what we call today meritocracy. Those who merit lead, right? And it's a very Jewish and it's also a very American uh, value, right? Um, and so... But, 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 but in this case, it wasn't that... that Isaac made the decision, it was kind of like a shenanigan. Yeah, but here we're... Uh, <laughs> it's a different matter, but, but here... But, I mean, maybe, but here, he, maybe Joseph merited it, but that's not how he got it. You mean Jacob. I mean Jacob. Yeah, but now we're with the next generation. No, no, so we'll see what's going on here. Let's see what's going on here. Verse 14. So Israel stretched his hand, and he put it on Ephraim's head. Ephraim is the younger, and he's putting his right hand on Ephraim. And, and his left hand on Menashe, that's 14. Uh, and then in verse 15, Vayvarech et Yosef, he's blessing Joseph. And then on verse 16, there's a very beautiful blessing that, um, that people bless children for today. Uh, the angel who redeemed me from all harm, says Jacob. The, Jacob. the angel who saved me from my brother Esav, from my uncle Lavan, uh, from all the terrible situations I found. May he bless those, the youth, the, the two young men here. Uh, and let, they be, let them be named upon me. They're going to become like two of the tribes. There's no tribe of Yosef, as we said. There are tribes of Ephraim and Menashe. Where, where are you, Rabbi? Verse 16. Ve'idgul And may they become, multiply abundantly like fish. All right? And that's really the end of the second Aliyah for Shabbat. Now, uh, in verse 17, Joseph saw that his father was placing his right hand on Ephraim's head, and it displeased him. Uh, and verse 18, and, and, He actually moved it? Wow. Joseph said to his father, Not so, father, for this one is the firstborn. Verse 19, Joseph said to his father, Not so, father, for this one is the firstborn. Verse 19, Jacob says to Joseph, his son, Tranquilo, my son, I know what I'm doing. Right? yadati I know, my son, I know, this one will also become a great people, a great tribe. Vulam achiv hakatan yigdal mimeno. That brother will become greater. Um, okay? Um, so, uh, Rashi brings forth all kinds of great men that came out from them. So, from Ephraim, Joshua came who took over from Moses' leadership. Ephraim was the younger one, right? Right. And from Menashe, who was the older one, Gideon, the judge, one of the military leaders, came forth. And on verse 2, we have that blessing which Jewish parents give their boys on Friday night. And verse 20, Yesimcha Elokim Ke'ephraim V'chi Menashe. May God make you like uh, Ephraim and Menashe. Which is... 
which is uh, which is the blessing that parents give their kids. Uh, yeah, we're gonna go a little bit ahead so we can cover more ground. But what does it mean to be like Menashe and Ephraim? It means to be uh, prosperous both materially and spiritually, and to have um, great descendants come from their midst, like the ones Rashi mentions, like Joshua and Gideon. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's according to Hasidism, it's really the goal of Jewish spiritual life is to... Um, take abundance, material abundance in this world and spiritualize it. Um, so, on verse 1 in chapter 49, now we have the blessings. You know how the Torah ends? The Torah ends, we read it on Simchat Torah, Moses is blessing each tribe. And that's parallel to what's happening now. Jacob, Israel, is dying, he's blessing each son, which will become the head of each tribe. Understand what I'm saying? Now, in, in verse 2, it says, He kavtsu v'shim'u b'nei Yaakov. Come and hear the children of uh, Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Your father is speaking now. Now, that word shim'u intimates the Shema, Shema Israel. Oh, the Talmud says... To listen? Yeah. Right. Uh, Where is that? It's on verse 2. Chapter 49, verse 2. Okay. So it says... Um, oh. The, ta- the Talmud says... Yes. Uh, the Talmud says, in Tractate Psachim, so what's the origin of Shema Yisrael? Is that Jacob's children realize that their father might be uh, about to die very worried that they are living in a very degenerate place. And uh, spiritually degenerate, materially degenerate, and, and that they, and he's worried about Jewish continuity for his descendants. So they decided they're all going to congregate around his bed and tell him, don't worry, we only believe in Hashem, and Hashem is one, we're not idolaters. So Israel, they came, exactly they came up to him and said, "Shema Israel." Israel is their father's name. Listen, Dad. Hashem Elokeinu. Hashem is our God. Hashem Echad. And God is one. And really? That, and that that's the midrash in the Talmud. Wow. Yeah. And then Jacob, his dying words were, "Baruch Hashem Kvart Malchut Olam Va'et." Really? May God's majestic name be blessed forever and ever. Right. So it's a it's a teaching for. Uh, wow. All Very Jewish powerful. parents, yeah, right? And then he blesses Reuven, and he also tells him that he messed up once after uh, Rachel died, and, and Jacob moved his bed to Bilah's tent, which was one of the uh, concubines uh, or surrogate mothers, and Reuven became upset that Jacob didn't move his bed into his mother's tent, who was Leah. So Jacob gives him some rebuke for that. In verse 5, um, Jacob is giving rebuke to Shimon and Levi, because they took the law into their own hands after Dina, their sister, was violated in Shechem, and they massacred uh, the males of the city without asking for their father's uh, permission. Um, uh, in their wrath they killed a man so what kind of blessings are these uh, in verse 7 he says to Shimon and Levi Arur apam, cursed be their wrath so he's cursing their wrath he's not cursing them but the teaching that I like to bring from this is that if you're really close to someone either it's a relative or a close friend you have an obligation in opportune times when it's relevant and timely to, to share with that person their weaknesses and what maybe even things happened to them or transpired because they made mistakes. Because if 
with those people that we are really the closest to, if we're not going to give them that critique, nobody else, and they're only receptive to receiving it from us. Every person has a very, hand, a very small number of people, a mere handful, that he's willing to be criticized from, right? You know, I can think about myself, and I know, you know, there are a handful of people, family and close friends, that if they tell me even harsh things, I'm going to listen to it and I won't be defensive. Because I know that they fully love me and this and that. We, we're all like that, pretty much. So here, Jacob is teaching us something, which is, if you're really, really close to someone, you also have an obligation to that person sometimes to tell them, watch out, don't do this again. Or you have a tendency, you know I love you, you also have a tendency sometimes for X or Y, watch out on that, you know, that comes back to bite you, that kind of thing. So he's cursing their wrath. Then he praises Judah like a lion. Judah is the undesignated leader. And, um, well, where is he in the pecking order? He's the fourth. Then he calls Issachar. So Ephraim is not the youngest, he's just the younger. Ephraim is Joseph, is a grandson. Ephraim, oh, it's okay. Menashe and Ephraim are Joseph's children. He blessed them, and later on, in a different scene, he called all the kids. This is a different scene. You understand? Yeah, I'm. Yeah, I, I thought we were talking about getting the blessing from Israel. Yeah, but first he called Joseph and he blessed the grandkids. They oh. went home. Oh. New scene. A different day or a different hour in the same day, all the kids are coming. Imagine a scene. A grandpa is, in his di- is on his deathbed. But I thought we said here that... And, here and two have... grandkids come to visit him in his hospital. And later on, all the kids come. Do you understand? That's what's going on. It's two different scenes. The was scenes, that the scene where you were setting up where people were standing? That was only for the two grandkids from Joseph. Okay, so... And now it's a different scene when all the kids come. All right? Make sense? Mm. And, and on verse 13, imagine somebody is in hospital. Two grandkids show up first. talking about like the blessing like between Esau and, and his brother, you know how they stole the blessing. Well, they are, these are very spiritual blessings. Okay, and, and but it's, it's not like you're getting the kingdom. Blessing. No, it's not. That's what I thought you meant by that kind yeah, of blessing. It's not like a supremacy blessing. Yeah, kind of like yeah. Cause between Esau and Jacob. Right, okay. right. So that's not what's happening. It's a very good point because nobody's disinherit. Nobody's being disavowed. Is that the word? Or disinherited. Or, right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, Zevulon on verse thirteen will dwell on the coasts. The tribe of Zevulon are the tribes of merchants and businessmen. That's why they lived on the coast in Israel. And Issachar is a bony donkey. That's uh, 14. So the tradition is in the Jewish people that we need a Zevulun, we need our business people, right? And they give money to Israel and to worthy causes. In every synagogue, in every community, you have the people who really help the synagogue exist. And then you have the Issachar. Why are they rendered analogous to a donkey? Because they can carry the yoke of Torah on their back, explains Rashi. These are people who dedicate their lives to Torah study. We need them too, right? We need those people who dedicate their lives to Torah study. Uh, so he goes on uh, to bless uh, the tribe of, of Dan, who will uh, avenge his people. Rashi explains from the Philistines years later. And that's the end of the fourth. Now we go to the fifth Aliyah. Uh, What's the number? Chapter 49, verse 19, he's blessing uh, the tribe of, of, uh, of, da, of, uh, of, of, da, of uh, God, rather, um, that he will be a real trooper. And it's very poetic and esoteric, so I'm only giving you like the cliff notes. Um, Naphtali in verse 21 is like a swift gazelle. Um, uh, okay. Naphtali is whose? Um, is they're all their kids. They're all his children. Uh, Naphtali is whose son? Uh, uh, not not Rachel only had Joseph and Benjamin. That's it. Okay. 
Okay, so this is the son of what man? They're all the children of Jacob. Okay. Except the first two that he blessed like that were uh -huh. his grandchildren. Okay, the, all so the others all the others are the sons. <coughs> Okay. Everyone else, except those two, Ephraim and Menashe. And now he gets to Joseph in verse 22. Ben Porat Yosef, a charming son, charming to the eye. Um, Rashi says something a little funny. He says, uh, the women of Egypt the strode out on the wall to gaze upon his beauty. Right? Oh my God, that's yeah. funny. Yeah, he was like the... But it's uh, in the Torah part, too, not just Rosh Rashi. Right. Daughters tread on the wall. Right, right. Um, and... Oh, uh, expert bowmen with hatred made him their target. So all, all the blessings uh, continue here. And uh, again, <laughs> I did this very expeditiously. In verse 27... He's blessing the. Uh, so I see. I see. The, the tribe of uh, of Benjamin. In twenty five, it says Shaddai. Right. That's. It's one of God's names. Is that the first time we see that in the Torah? Yes, I think so. And that name also. No, I don't think it's the first time. But uh, uh, next week, Hashem, God is going to tell Moses that he only re God only revealed God's presence to the patriarchs and matriarchs as Kel Shaddai and now he's revealing himself to Moses as Yud Hei Vav Hei and Rashi is going to explain next week what it means, it means that to the patriarchs and matriarchs he gave an open check they didn't know if that check is actually good, he said I'm going to make a great nation out of you and you're going to inherit the land of Israel, they believed that the check is good but they never got to see it but those who were slaves in Egypt, they got to actually cash the check. They got to actually see how they were redeemed. Okay. okay? It's a good question, and it proceeds uh, next week. Um, and he says to them in verse 29, after he blesses them, I'm going to be gathered into my people. Kivuoti, bury me in the cave where uh, my parents... And grandparents are also buried, which Abram brought and uh, buried there Sarah, and then he was buried there, and then uh, Itzchak and Rivka also. This is in Abram, huh? Correct. Is that part of, yeah. is that part of Egypt, though? No, it's uh, in Israel. It's in Israel. They go to Israel to do that. In chapter 50, it's a very moving scene. Uh, chapter 50, verse 1, Vayipol Yosef. Uh, Yosef falls on his father's face. And he weeps and kisses him, right? It's very moving. Uh, verse 2, And Joseph commanded his servant, uh, the physicians, to embalm his father, and the physicians embalmed Israel. So remember, this, th this is that? before the giving of the Torah. Now, yeah. supposedly would not supposed to be. Correct. And how did that change? So that's, that's before we got the Torah, you know? Um, they didn't have a lot of mitzvot back then. Um, what, who do they mean by the Egyptians? His, his servants. Uh, where Where are you? I'm sorry. I went. To, I went ahead to number three. Yeah. Well, he was. Uh, he it was. Took Forty days to yeah, a bomb. Yeah. Forty days. And uh, the Egyptians weep for him for seventy days. He was. He was a revered figure, a holy man. In, in the Egyptians' uh, eyes as well. Remember, Abram too, when he went to look for a burial site for Sarah, the Hittites called Abram, Nesi Elohim Atabetochenu, you are a prince of God in our midst. These people were living legends in their own lifetime. You know, beyond the fold of the Jewish people. It's like Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi of Great Britain, he has advised four prime ministers in England, uh, John Major, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, and David Cameron. I'm so confused. Right? So, Why are you confused? Who's the one that had the... Because I'm confused between Jacob and Joseph. That's what I'm, I'm oh. a little bit confused. Okay. Jacob is uh, Isaac's son who had the rivalry with Esau. Okay. And Joseph is uh, Jacob's son who was so, sold to slavery. So, but, but Joseph was the one that was the prince of Egypt, kind of. Correct. So how is it that the Egyptians 
knew about his dad. His dad wasn't there the whole time. His dad. Oh came. well, well, we mentioned earlier oh, that in, it's okay. It's last week's parsha that after Joseph revealed his true identity to his brothers, they all moved to Egypt, including his father. Right. We well, we, we skipped all the those moving scenes. Okay, but they they moved there, but I didn't realize like. I mean, the Egyptians knew Joseph, but I didn't <coughs> know that they knew his dad, too. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, they did, and they admired him greatly. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so in verse 5, Joseph is asking permission from the Pharaoh uh, to go bury uh his father Jacob in Israel and verse 7 go up and bury your father and they all go and uh, and bury him now look at verse 10 and they came to the threshing floor of the thorn bushes which is on the other side of the Jordan they got into Israel and there they conducted a very great and impressive eulogy for their father and he meaning Joseph made his, for his father a mourning of seven days. So this is... This is, a, this is the first source that I know of for Shiva. Interesting, right? Yes. Um, they gave a mourning for Jacob for seven days. For, for Correct. Yeah. And in verse 13, they bury him in the field of Machpelah, a cave of the matriarchs and patriarchs. Uh, and in verse 14, they return to Egypt, back to work. Verse 15, Joseph gets really upset. They thought that Joseph is going to be like Esau, Esau. Remember when Jacob got the blessing that Esau wanted to get from their father, he said, once daddy is going to die, I'm going to kill Jacob. And that's why J Jacob had to run away from home. So here the brothers are thinking that Joseph is now going to, that he's like the godfather, that now that the uh, father is dead, he's going to kill them. So they think the same thing is going to happen. Yeah. Uh, and they tell Joseph in verse 16, so they commanded messengers to Joseph to say, your father commanded us before his death, saying, please forgive now your brother's transgressions. And at the end of that verse, 17, Vayevk Yosef. <laughs> Joseph wept when they spoke to him. And he tells them in verse 19, Vayomer alem Yosef, Al tirau, fear not. Ki hatachat elokim ani? Am I instead of God? You think I'm going to take uh, vengeance? And he tells them again in verse 20, Atem chashavtem alay rao. You wished me ill. God designed it for the good. So again, he's reassuring them that, uh, that he is not going to do any foul play. And, and in verse 21, he says, don't worry, I'm still going to provide for you. And he reassures them. And Joseph continues to live in Egypt until the 110. Look, out what's ha look at what's happening on verse 24. That's the last three verses of the Parsha. Okay? It says... Um, Vayomer Yosef Elechav, and Joseph said to his brothers, Anochimet, I'm, behold, I'm going to die. Velokim pakod yifkelotchem. Hashem is going to summon you, and take you up from this land to the land that He promised Abe, Ike, and Jake. <laughs> Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Vayesh, Vayesh ba Yosef et Nei Israel emo. So Joseph made his siblings swear that when God will remember you and take you, you're going to take my bones with me and re-intern me, re-bury me in Israel. Did, and, 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 when, and the last verse is that Joseph died, he was 110, and they embalmed him, and he was placed into the coffin in Egypt. Indeed, that's what's happened. When, uh, so he didn't get moved? He did, he did get moved. Oh, okay. And, and um, you know, it's... There are a lot of things going on here. When, when we get out of Egypt, we're carrying Joseph, you know, the Torah says that they were carrying Joseph on their shoulders. And it's a teaching that as we travel through life, we need to carry the wisdom and the spirit of our ancestors with us, right? 
Do you feel that your parents, even your grandparents sometimes, even after they left the world, some of them, they still carry you in life, you still hear their voice, their wisdom, right? It's that kind of symbolic idea. But there is also here something which is Maaseh Avot Siman Lebanim, which is an omen for things to come. You know, uh, Herzl, when he became the uh, political leader of Zionism, he wrote in his diary in German in 1897, after the first Zionist Congress, that um, that uh, the Jewish state will come into being uh, in five to fifty years. And he was right, because fifty years after that, in 1947, the UN decided to create a Jewish state alongside an Arab state. But he wrote in his will that he wants to be reburied in Israel. And he was. Mount Herzl in Jerusalem is where the prime ministers and the presidents and a lot of dignitaries and war heroes are laid to rest. And Herzl was take his remains were taken from the, the cemetery in Vienna and moved to Israel, just like Joseph was moved from Egypt. Where is Joseph buried? Do we know? Kever Yosef, I believe it's outside Shechem. Outside Shechem. In Israel? Yeah. But you know, when you obviously go visit Israel, there is no mention of Joseph's burial. To, to no, no, there is, there is, there is, there is. It's just uh, it's uh, under the do- it, yeah, it's in the area of the Palestinian Authority. But I think that you know there there are convoys for people who want to go there. It's possible to go there um, now. Hold on, I want to show you something. Let's conclude for today in uh, four minutes, three minutes. I want to show you, we don't usually do it, but let's go very quickly to page 1090, 1091. Okay? 1091 is the Aftara, the prophetic section for... um, for us this Shabbat from the first book of Kings. So we see Jacob dies, but the Talmud says he never died because we continue his way. We are the children of Israel, (coughs) Joseph, and now King David also never died. As long as we pray with Tehillim, which he wrote, he's still with us. It's very beautiful. You can follow in the English if you want. And, And King David's uh, death drew near. And he told his son Shlomo, who became King Solomon thereafter, It's very beautiful. I'm about to walk in the way of every living being upon this earth. It's a very poetic way of saying I'm going to die, right? Be strong and become a man. And uh, observe the mitzvot and walk in God's ways and all the statutes and uh, the chukim, the mitzvot that are not rational, and the, mitz- the, the, the mishpatim, the universal laws of morality, the edotav, the testimonials like Shabbat, that Hashem is the creator, leman taskil, so that you should become enlightened in everything that you do and wherever you turn. And uh, that way the Davidic dynasty uh, will continue. Um, so... Davidic. Right. Uh, what did I say? Davidic. Davidic, yeah. So, um, yeah. And at the end it says that uh, King David reigned 40 years in Hebron and 7 years in Jerusalem. Uh, no, uh, 40 years altogether. 7 in Hebron and 33 in Jerusalem. And Shlomo took over. So I just wanted to show you in the Aftarah as well, there's a very dramatic kind of uh, moment of uh, passage from uh, one generation to another. Right. So, so Baruch Hashem. Just, just, a very short Aftarah. Who wrote the Aftarah? Who wrote the Aftarah? Yes. Um, it depends which ones. The book of Jeremiah, we think Jeremiah had a scribe called Baruch ben Neria. Um, so we believe that he wrote the book of Jeremiah and also the, the scroll of Eicha 
book of Lamentations we read on Tisha B'Av? Um, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, we don't know for sure some of these who wrote them, you know. The book of Ecclesiastes is attributed to King Solomon. Um, you know, in the scholarly world there are a lot of conjectures and debates. And uh, in the Talmud you find the sages <coughs> attributing different books to different people and some of the prophets, it's their own words, they wrote them down. So, yeah. We start a new book next week. Yeah. So we say uh, to ourselves this Shabbat, uh, once we finish the Torah, Chazak, Chazak, Venit Chazak. May we be strong and may we be strengthened. We're going into Thank the you. Book of Genesis.